We're going to take questions at the end because we like to talk super fast. Generally, we hate webinars because they're so boring. So we're going to try and just keep this really snappy, keep it moving. Um, there are three of us on this, and we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves right now. So uh, I'm Corbett. Hi, I'm Grace. And we got John Bergman here. John? Hello, everybody. I am John Bergman. <laughs> Uh, he's the super handsome guy on the right in color. We're the uh, less uh, colorful couple on the left. But I look dynamic. So she okay. super does. Yeah, she's actually <laughs> really laughing. So uh, my name is Corbett. I uh, work with all three of these guys. John actually has moved on, and he works on much bigger buildings than what, especially what we're talking about today. But we all were a company together uh, until about a year ago when we... Um, Grace and I went downsize and John went upsize. So now we're talking we're coming together to design this tiny lab, which is a super exciting project that we're going to be showing to everybody around the country, hopefully 16 cities. Um, so Grace, do you have anything to add about your uh, involvement? Well, um, for those who don't know, um, if you can't assume from the Corbett and Grace Lunsford, we are married. And uh, so this tiny lab is also going to be our tiny house for an entire year with our cats, too, our little fur babies. Um, so a lot of considerations have gone into not only the performance, but the aspect of, okay, we're going to be living in this and living on the road with it. And then wherever we land, we're probably going to continue to live in the tiny house for quite some time. So, so I this just is, wanna... yeah, it's not an experiment. This is an actual tiny house, just like tiny house that you'd see. John, why don't you go ahead and introduce any other details that you'd like to say? Uh, well, first off, I just want to say thanks for inviting me. Um, I worked with Corbett for about five years, Corbett and Grace for about five years. And uh, as you said, I've moved on to a, a bigger firm doing different type of work, but uh, these two are complete blast to work with, so I hope I had the opportunity to do that when they're on the road. Awesome. And so aside from being a super nice guy and a Southern gentleman, um, mm -hmm. John also is an actual engineer, and neither Grace nor I are trained in this stuff. So um, we're going to go ahead and get into it here, but John is going to be able to answer much more technical questions than we will be able to. So the point of performance, what we teach uh, homeowners and contractors with our company to build performance workshop that we're eager to share with you on what we're doing is... Uh, first of all, that you want to create this kind of a place to live. Durable, healthy, well-built. It's super simple, right? Uh, also, we want to avoid waste because waste is one of the things that pisses us off in general. It's just, if you're going to spend time doing something, let's do it right, right? So we can do all of this stuff that will make sure that we are not wasting our time and our money and all of the things that we're putting into this, including losing sleep at night, etc., we're going to prevent problems down the road, right? So we're going to make sure that this place is as easy to take care of as possible. And we're going to make the most out of just everything that we do. Now, you will notice that energy efficiency is not on this list. And that is a big, big deal. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that this will be an energy efficient home. Uh, Grace and I do believe in energy efficiency. But the point of home performance has very little to do with energy efficiency. It is a side effect of having a well-performing or a performance-proven home. So the goal of all of this really is having control over your house, just like you want to have control over your body. If you have uncontrolled stuff happening in your uh, digestive system, that is not fun. Same thing with your house. Anybody who's a homeowner out there, and you can feel free to raise your hand silently um, and acknowledge that, yeah, it's really hard. There's a lot of stuff that goes wrong. Um, and so what you want to do is, in three steps, make sure that this is going to work. There is planning and design stage, and that's why we work with people who are building a new home or people who are putting up a, an apartment building. And we make sure that all of the design elements and the details and how we're going to exactly do this or that uh, little component is put in there. Then when construction starts, we make sure that it happens exactly the way that it was planned and that everything was installed to a level of quality that was achieved. And then at the end, you just check everything and you make sure that it worked and that is with performance testing and performance testing is what is all about and that's what we're going to be doing uh, in the main teaching people about around the country uh, just making sure that people understand that performance testing can be used to to avoid all of those problems that we already talked about so uh, last year in March Dow Building Solutions uh, was very nice to come on board as the premier sponsor for our Proof is Possible event. And we were going to do events in all these different cities. And we decided, you know what, 
Uh, it was great working with a giant corporation, but frankly, we're a tiny company and we move super, super fast. And we don't really have time to wait around for um, giant corporations to make up their mind on how many and where they want to do this. So we are going to travel the country in 2016. We're going to 16 cities and do the proof is possible U.S. tour all at one go. So we're going to live in this thing, and we're just going to literally trace a 16-city tour around the, the U.S. Those cities will be picked later this year, uh, and you'll find out more about that in the upcoming webinars um, that follow this one in the series. So that's why we want to live in a tiny house. It's different than an RV, obviously. If you know about tiny homes, you know all these arguments about mobile homes and tiny homes and all that stuff. Uh, that being said, I do not believe that every American should live in a tiny home. Some of my best clients, like when we do this to make money, we work often for very uh, wealthy people who have very big, complicated homes. I don't, my goal is not to talk people out of having 10 plasma screen TVs in their house. I know that that, uh, <laughs> when you walk into somebody's house and they have a hot tub inside and a pool and three wine cellars and blah, 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 and an indoor basketball court, it, it, it can be easy to judge. But there are a lot of people who can't go out, like if they're famous enough, they can't go to the gym. Um, so those kinds of houses, I'm not trying to outlaw or anything. What I want is to make sure that everybody understands that the designing of a tiny house is actually exactly like the planning of a regular house, except it's smaller. And it has exactly the same systems involved, except they're simpler. And when you build it, it's exactly the same construction, except it's faster and it's easier to take care of down the road. So if we can get every single American to actually understand how a tiny home gets planned and built, we all become better homeowners of our normal sized homes if we choose not to live tiny. I love tiny living and we'll show you in a second here. We, uh, this is how we live right now. Can you do me a favor and get the neck? Yeah. I want to freeze up. Mm -hmm. uh, that is our cat, that is our desk. This is how we work uh, all day long. It seems a little ridiculous, but yeah, that's our 750 square foot condo on the left. And that's how we roll. Uh, during the day. Grace and I both work from the house. We both work at the same table. Yes, we spend every minute together already. So we live tiny as it is. Uh, so we, we feel prepared because of that. And not only that, we also have prepared for the tiny living piece uh, by taking care of um, knowing what we're getting into by staying in tiny homes. So we have actually visited this hotel, which is in Portland. It's called the Tiny Home Hotel. Um, and if you haven't seen it online, definitely check it out. And if you have not visited it and you're thinking about doing tiny homes or living in one or even just staying in one for more than one night, go check it out. We stayed for two nights. We stayed in one each night and it was super interesting. Yeah. Staying in these tiny houses is super enlightening. Um, and they rotate the tiny houses at the tiny house hotel. So you can go one year and try a couple. And if you're thinking about doing this in five years or 10 years, whatever, you can go back and try a couple different models. And um, for us, we, we tried one with a pitched roof and an upper loft and quickly found out that two people in a pitched roof, upper loft. Peaked roof. I peaked think roof, yeah, yeah um, can be a little uncomfortable. In fact, at one point, a bunch of bottles from a, um, a dumpster got moved and I woke up and I, I, I kind of sat up in bed and immediately bonked my head. Yeah, there were no dormers in that one. It was a one person tiny house. Anyway, that was you, you can see both of these tours on our YouTube channel. Definitely check them out. Yeah, you should check those out. So uh, this was the first tiny house that we ever saw and it's ridiculously tiny. But what we want to make sure that everybody understands is that a tiny home must be able to survive and in fact do well in earthquakes and hurricanes at the same time on a regular basis. That is the point of a touring tiny home. Now, most people do not move their tiny house more than one time every couple of years because you move. We are building one that is designed to move around the country. That is a little bit different, and that's why we wanted to show you guys what we're doing with this because hardly anybody talks about the engineering of tiny homes and how exactly to make sure that it can withstand these forces all the time. So the engineering is why we brought John Bergman into the conversation. So, John, would you please talk about the wind stress a little bit, just to start with? Certainly will do. Before I kick that off, I will say one quick thing. Uh, I am still sitting in my office right now, and a cleaning crew just came in, so if you hear noises around me, that will explain what that is. So, <laughs> um, so yes, as Corey mentioned, these houses are going to be subjected to all sorts of dynamic stresses that most structures are not. Uh, most structures that we analyze are pretty much in a static state for the entirety of their lives. Yes, there's some wind loading and snow loading and things like that, but for the most part, they pretty much sit still. 
So as soon as we start, you know, attaching this tiny house to a vehicle and driving around the country, um, we are going to be pushing on, you know, the unit, which is going to cause some stresses that, you know, force it front to back, side to side. They're a little abnormal as, a, as you know, you would compare it to a standard house. Um, we'll be pulling things apart, so it'll be both compression and tension. Um, we will be experiencing shear forces, which is basically, I don't know if uh, the, the term shear plane sounds familiar to you guys, but it's essentially when one cohesive element has a slip plane where it wants to separate itself along, you know, a, a, a surface. Um, and then lastly, we have uplift forces. Uh, these uplift forces will certainly tear the roof right off, you know, one of these houses um, or cause uplift of the tiny house itself uh, in the same way that an airplane as it's, you know, flying through the air has an uplift force that brings it actually off the ground. So you can see if you, uh, having this first conversation with John, when we were looking at this design on the right, and if you guys know tiny homes, you know where that's from. That's from New Zealand. Um, that's the uh, catamaran guy, right? So we, I showed him this design and he was like, hmm, that's interesting. Well, the wind's going to want to rip that. There, there's a... Eve on the far right there at the back of it. And he was like, well, that thing is going to get torn off. Um, so that was kind of a, an amazing thing to think of, that the shape of it is very, very uh, delicate kind of in the balance of how it's going to act when it's going down the road because houses don't go down the road. That's ridiculous. So what we're doing is building something that we're not sure whether it's actually a house or is it a vehicle because vehicles, as you can notice when you walk down the street, almost all cars nowadays look very similar. Right, except for the front and the back, the, the lights basically, because they've spent a lot of time in these aerodynamic chambers trying to design them to be perfectly aerodynamic. And these things that you're looking at do not look aerodynamic. <laughs> and they're not designed for those stresses that John's talking about, the push and the pull. And by the way, these straps, um, the cross strapping, what he pointed out to me was that this one that you can see going from the front bottom corner to the top rear corner is the important one. You can actually get rid of that other one because that, that force of pulling that strap is the what, what we're really trying to protect against. So back in the day when we were pulling these things with horse-driven carts, that was uh, a little bit different than what we're doing now. So the water stress is another one that uh, we were really wanted to make sure that we take care of because obviously we want this thing to last for as long as possible. We have no idea whether that's going to be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I highly doubt that it's going to be more than 30 years. But we have to take care of top-down precipitation, right? Just like in any normal house. And uh, if you've been to Venice which we did last year. It was so enlightening. Venice has been crumbling for 500 years and they don't really care. I do care when it comes to our house because we're not going to be able to just patch things up and, you know. Right. We can't just build on top of it, uh, essentially, which is what Venice has done. Exactly. It has to be sleek. It's got to do what it's supposed to do. So just like any house, you would want to have eaves. We can't do that because we have minimum clearances for roads, and I will get into that in a moment. We have to also protect it front to back, which is unlike a lot of houses. We have uh, essentially wind-driven rain that's going to be wrapping itself from the front of the house around the sides of the house and straight back because we're going to be pulling the same 50 miles an hour down a road, possibly when it rains. Uh, we're going to try and avoid that if we can. Yeah, so if there's anybody out there who knows flashing, you just had a little bit of a heart attack on the concept of that. <laughs> yeah, so now we have to flash in two directions. We have to make sure wind, uh, excuse me, that rain won't be able to get in top down or front to back. And we got bottom up because we're gonna ride through puddles. Even if we're driving through when there is no rain, there's still gonna be puddles and we've gotta have this splashing coming up from below, which is, again, super freaky. Uh, just like having something like a um, sprinkler positioned right next to your house, next to the window or something like that, and it's just kind of splashing window, you know, rain up into your house. Uh, we have outside in humidity movement and inside out humidity movement. So all this stuff, we have to really try and engineer a way to control all of this, not to stop it because we can't stop any of this. It's life is difficult, right? So we have to just try to make sure that it's mitigated as much as possible and controlled and we know what's going to happen. So after we showed John the, the shape that's on the uh, middle bottom right there, which is, again, the New Zealand shape, which I think is super cool still. But uh, we want to make sure that there are the least amount of corners possible because corners, want, and if you're going to attend future webinars this later this month, every week we're going to talk about this, uh, corners are the enemy of air sealing and of insulating. 
So both of those things are super, super important to controlling the things about this tiny little space that we're going to have rolling around the country. So less corners, the better. And the one that we showed there has a lot of corners. Also, we want to shed front to back for water and for air and for obstacles like, for example, um, if you've seen the tiny house giant journey guys from New Zealand, uh, they were nervous about low hanging power lines. The power lines are all supposed to be at at least 13 and a half feet, but maybe they sag a little bit. If you've got a peaked roof driving down the house or driving down the, the road and it catches a power line, that thing is going to get ripped off of the power <laughs> uh, line that it's attached to, right? So we wanted to make sure that if there were any low hanging power lines, they go up and just slide gently and totally harmlessly off the back. Uh, we need to make sure that all of the furniture is built in. We don't want to have any chairs sitting around or anything like that can be knocked around. And we need to have a low center of gravity. And John's going to talk about that in a few minutes here as well. And we know that we've got a 13 and a half foot maximum height off the road bed. And the trailer is going to eat up a fair amount of that. So we've got an inside height of 1010 because of the sandwich uh, assemblies that we've got for the roof. Uh, for the walls, for the um, extra clearance that we've got for the on top of the roof where we've got the actual roofing material, etc. So here was the first draft that we had, and obviously we nixed this because it's got corners, because it's got this wind lift issue, and because the center of gravity on any tiny house that's got a high loft is high. If you haven't looked into it, and we're going to get into this obviously in the bells and whistles portion, that mattress that you're looking at right there in that high loft has to have no VOCs coming from it, which means either you have to get a cotton mattress, which is, if you've never slept on one, not super comfortable. I'm married to a super elegant lady, and she needs to sleep on something that supports her well, right? So <laughs> we, we, we went to mattress shopping, and we found a place that has these mattresses that are like, have foam, but there's no off-gassing, and it's very healthy for breathing, because obviously there's a tiny little space. We can't have any formaldehyde or VOCs or anything like that in there. And again, we're going to talk about this later, but that thing weighs 140 pounds. So the higher up it is, the more of an issue that is for turning. So we built these models in SketchUp. And if you don't know how to use this tool, it's super easy. It's free. John Bergman taught me how in uh, an hour and a half, and I taught the very basic essentials in about a half an hour video on our YouTube channel. So check that out. We were trying for a 20 foot trailer. Just because that sounded reasonable to us, 24 is the one, you know, often the biggest one that you can get. Um, but here's a 20 foot trailer, and you can see, hmm, there's something wrong with this picture. Now, a lot of this is in, fr it's just the frame kind of of what's going on at the very front of the trailer there. It would be the kitchen with a window over it. The door is on the side. At the back, you can see there's a little bit of a step up, and that would be where the dining area is. And then the bed would trundle out underneath that dining area. And there's a little loft for like a day bed and our musical instruments and things like that. There is something missing from this tiny house. It's a bathroom. So we would have to shower and go to the bathroom in the kitchen sink, which is not going to work. So this 20 foot thing just did not work for us. So what we ended up going with is a 24 foot uh, trailer. It's got a shed roof going front to back at a one and a half to 12 roof pitch, which is basically the same as seven degrees up. Right, it's 24 feet long. We're going to get it, generally they're built 7 foot 10 inches wide by tiny home builders in Atlanta, uh, which is who is building our trailer. But we're going to have them expanded a little bit because we're not going to do eaves on the side. We want to maximize our interior space. We also are going to build in to the floor so that the floor of the uh, living space is actually the floor of the trailer. It's the cavities that are built into it. So we're not building on top of the trailer. We're building down into it. Um, for that, you have to use special plumbing fixtures and things like that. We're going to obviously get into that in another uh, webinar. And we've got this front shed here. So we wanted to be able to keep our batteries for the deep cycle for the solar system, the propane tanks, the water heater, the fan for ventilation, all that stuff outside the house but we wanted to protect it. So we built this aerodynamic shed and it's this thing, it does look a little bit space age, um, which we think is actually kind of cool. But uh, again, it's built to tour, not to just sit there. So the framing plan is as follows. And again, all of this stuff was built in SketchUp, which is again, a free tool, we highly recommend it. We want to use the least amount of wood possible. We will talk about this next week when we talk about the insulation, but the more wood we've got, the less insulation you can have. And that does not agree, right? So we want to make sure that there's as much insulation as possible. So we built 24 inches on center. That means that every 24 inches, there will be a piece of wood that is a framing member, whether it's in the ceiling um, for the roof joists or whether it's in the walls. 
there is no floor framing. Like we already said, we're using the cavities that are in the trailer. And we don't need to use any special materials. This is exactly the same as building a regular house. You can go to Home Depot or Lowe's or Menards or any home improvement store or lumberyard and get this stuff. Uh, so the floor of the roof looks as follows on the left. The floor um, for the framing of the trailer is 16 inches on center but we went with 24 inches on center for everything else because it all needs to line up perfectly well. And you can see on the front is a small short wall that's about seven foot 10 uh, high. And then at the back is that 10, 10 wall that we talked about. That's got the one window in it. So the framing plan comes up with 92 pieces of wood, 36 pieces of plywood, 198 square feet of roof material, whatever it is that we decide to sheathe the roof with, which we're going to talk about soon. And the windows can go anywhere except for the two windows that we've called out. There's a door and there are two windows, one on the side and one in the back that you can see there. Um, this is very cool, the fact that we've used 24 inches on center framing, because that means that as long as we put a window between uh, framing members, we don't need to add these headers. The header is where we interrupt the flow of every 24 inches, there's a piece of wood going up and down, right? So as long as we buy windows that are less than two feet wide, we could put them wherever we want with no change in the framing plan at all. And this is something that you should really consider if you're thinking about designing one of these, which again, I think every homeowner in the world should do because we'll get better at being homeowners. Or if you're actually designing one yourself, just get the windows to be less than two feet wide and you can put them anywhere. Um, now, again, these headers, you want to make sure to sandwich them with insulation if possible. This is the header right up here, and it's important for structural support because we don't have this thing supporting the weight of the roof anymore. So we need to make sure that this weight right here gets distributed to this and this, and that's what it's for. Okay, so this is what it finally looks like. This is our final layout. Now, obviously, this is a little bit framey. We wanted to make sure that you guys could see basically everything. Um, on the very front of the trailer, we've got the bathroom. Do you want to say anything about the bathroom? Uh, sure. Well, we definitely did opt for a compostable toilet, which a lot of tiny house people are going for. You can see ours is that lovely square over there. For some reason, Google SketchUp didn't have compostable toilets in there. Uh, oh, that's okay. Yeah, so we're going to go with <laughs> the nature's head, yeah, because it's it happens to be a tried and true kind of a technology. It's 19 inches square, so that's why we just built that square in there, just to make sure. But if you look carefully, you'll actually see that there's a rectangle above that. And uh, if you heard me earlier, I mentioned that we are going to be on this road with um, our cats. We love our fur babies, so we are bringing them with us. And we have actually designed in a litter box container that is above the bathroom, um, or above specifically the toilet in the bathroom. And there's a little bit of a drop down from the cat loft that we have built above <laughs> the bathroom. And that's that gray platform you can see on the far left there. Yeah, so and the other great thing about that is we can connect, and again, we'll, we'll get into this with the bells and whistles, um, but the, the fan uh, for the exhaust of the bathroom can also be used to exhaust uh, the litter box. Yeah, the fan is something that's super cool that we're going to talk about later. So the kitchen you can see is right outside of that. The front door is the blue thing on the right. We tried to take it away so you can see as much as possible. But uh, the kitchen is easy. That is the one sink in the entire place. And until you have lived in a tiny house for a day and just tried out having one sink for the entire thing for both the bathroom and for the kitchen, it, it is possible to do that. And so our sink is going to be, Grace wants to do an apron front. We'll show you in the bells and whistles side of things, but it's like a super nice sink. So we're really investing in this thing. A couple windows, I guess you get. And then also the dining area, which is this really cool diner booth. And that is, we're going to really get more into that on the bells and whistles side of things. Um, but it's this very, very cool setup with a crawl under loft where you can see the mattress is. And that helps to get that center of gravity low, which we're going to talk about uh, and uh, and one other thing I just have to say, when you go and you watch the Tiny House Tour videos on our YouTube channel, the Skyline, I think it's the number two um, video that we shot, they had an underloft, and we were totally comfortable. And you can do really great things with lighting in it, and it becomes a very kind of cozy space and almost a sanctuary because you're in this one room environment so how do you get away or how if you got a headache and you just really want to lay down how do you get away and we really found that the underloft gave us that sense of privacy yeah it was very nice so john why don't you talk about the weight great so uh this spreadsheet that corbett has in front of you um he provided to me it essentially is every single component that's going to be uh composed of the tiny house 
is going to be composed of all these components. And he did an excellent job of identifying not only how much, uh, you know, how many pieces are going to be involved, but exactly how much they weigh. Um, and then as you guys have seen, the layouts that he's been providing you give you a pretty good idea of exactly where they're going to be located. So using that information, he tasked me with kind of running through a few alternatives to determine where the center of gravity for this tiny house is going to be. So uh, the reason that we even care about this is we want to make sure that the vehicle or the tiny house doesn't tip over. Um, clearly, that's uh, a safety concern. You don't want a house that's not going to be able to be towed behind a truck, especially at high speeds, which you will be seeing once you're on you know, the interstate. Um, this is obviously going to be on a trailer, so we want to know where the axles for this trailer should be located. And that's important because most of these trailers are pretty customized. Um, so identifying where the center of gravity is, uh, we could adjust that axle location to make sure this thing is perfectly balanced, even if it wasn't attached to the truck. Um, and then most importantly, we need to be able to make sure that the truck can actually pull this thing. Um, so what we've done here is if this graphic you have in front of you uh, is sort of looking at this in a three-dimensional plane. So we have an X, Y, and a Z axis, and I don't mean to make that sound real boring, um, but in order to actually identify where this center of gravity is, uh, identifying which axis is which is a very important thing to do. This red arrow that you see right here is an arbitrary point in space um, that I chose to do this analysis. Um, we don't really need to get into that, but you know, essentially, I looked at this tiny house uh, from that point and identified all of those weights that Cobra provided me using that point as a reference point to identify the center of gravity. And essentially, John, uh, clarify for me if I'm wrong, but we, you were able to kind of push on the thing and see where it's like where it's dangerous. So, so for example, if we were to um, and, and you, I think that you told me that some of this stuff is impossible to do, <laughs> so tell me if I'm wrong. But if we were to, to run a little bit off the edge of the grade a little bit and the tiny house tips uh, because the wheels on the right go down into the ditch, like, are we able to know exactly when the danger zone uh, has entered? Yes, I mean, you could certainly analyze that. We didn't do that as part of this, but yeah, I said it's kind of one of those situations where even if we don't know that exact point, what we can identify is, you know, if we're comparing two different systems with this tiny house and we know what system will move that center gravity further down, we know that's going to help us. Um, so if you also th so think about the leaning tower of Pisa for a second, uh, anytime that their center of gravity edges over the base, you're going to topple. Um, so if we're able to kind of keep that center of gravity as center as possible to the structure, you could you know, have a two foot shoulder. Whereas if this thing wasn't engineered correctly, you could run off a one foot shoulder and possibly have a tip there. Yeah. Um, so just kind of identifying what strategies work best to keep that center of gravity in place. So using that arbitrary point space that I was talking about a moment ago, um, we analyzed this thing front to back, side to side, uh, top to bottom. So we basically want to look at it from multiple different angles. Um, so we looked at it, you know, from the rear view, from the side view, from the top view, uh, and did all sorts of analyses. And essentially what we're trying to do is identify where all of these weights lie in relation to that point, and then find out where the force that's going to resist that toppling, where that is located. Um, so, you know, again, like I said, we went side to side, front to back, and really the key direction that we're looking at is primarily the X access from a few slides back, but if you think about this thing being towed behind a truck, it's likely going to tip only in one direction. It's very unlikely that it's going to tip in the other two directions. So, meaning it's uh, not going to like flow end end over end like in Terminator or something like that, where it flips like does a somersault. <laughs> Correct. And it's yes. uh, yeah. Okay. But what is important about that direction is the front to back is identifying where those wheels should lie. So we, those are the two key things is to find out basically exactly where it laid front to back and where in, in the Z elevation also where that, that, that point landed. So again, using all of that weight information that Cobra provided me, we were able to kind of subject this thing to all different directions and figure out exactly where the culmination of all those forces landed. And that point will be the point in which in theory, you could take you know a pin and support this entire tiny house and hold it and it would balance perfectly. So that's kind of the idea of what we're looking for. Now, with that information, we were able to analyze a few different things. So for instance, uh, Corbett had me look at two different roof systems, um, one being a standard two by six roof and the other being a SIP roof. Uh, and the idea there was to find out what impact those two roof systems had on the center of gravity. Um, 
Um, so what we're kind of looking at here is just comparing apples to apples. Nothing else changes except for that roof system. The roof, the SIP system dropped through one inch below the two by six system. And the two by six system fell exactly five foot, four inches above the deck of this tiny house. Um, so, you know, you can see there's bigger fish to fry here because we're not going to have a whole lot of impact with that one inch that we dropped. Um, so and and this, by the way, cool. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, John, but this is like the reason why we wanted to talk with John and talk to you and show you what we're doing here. Because like a lot of people assume that a new product, like, oh, if we use spray foam, that would be better. Or if we used sips to build this thing, that would be better. And that drives us crazy because it is absolutely not true that a, just a different product is going to fix it. It's all about the planning and design, the construction and installation, and then the testing um, so that's why we're taking so much time really talking about this. By the way, John, you, you had said that um, obviously it's no real surprise that it's dead center left to right because the thing is shaped symmetrically. But the front to back, you were kind of surprised that it was at dead center there too, right? It's like exactly 12 feet into Correct. the trailer. Yeah. And the reason that was so surprising, I mean, just look at the shape of it. You know, you have kind of uh, a lot more framing material plus the loft, everything that's in the back. So you would expect the center of gravity to fall backwards in, in space towards, you know, back to that, that arbitrary point that I discussed earlier. However, uh, you guys did an excellent job in locating your bathroom and that bathroom wall and the cat box and all that stuff. So by identifying uh, not only how much that stuff weighs, but its exact location, uh, brought that center of gravity almost to 12 feet on the exact nose front to back, which is exactly dead center of this trailer. So that was kind of cool. Uh, so, it, and the way you can kind of look at this is this, if that center of gravity is directly situated over the wheels like that, you could uns essentially unhitch this from the truck, and in theory, it should balance perfectly without, shouldn't tip back to forth, back and forth, um, which is pretty awesome. And we're getting, uh, and then, by the way, there's conflicting information. I, I'm, I've heard that you want 10% of the weight to be on the tongue. So we're, we're probably going to move it a little percentage back, and John will tell us exactly where that is. But, um, but yeah, it's, there's, there's that very fine line. But knowing exactly where that pin is that he's talking about is so valuable. Correct. And uh, we're, we're going to run this analysis further along. As this gets more developed, Corp is going to send over exactly, hey, we bought this, you know, type of toilet we know it weighs this much and we've got this sink and it weighs this much so we can refine this all the way through the end of the process um and one so, last thing that I'll, I'll kind of bring up with this uh center of gravity is that i didn't quite make it clear but that arbitrary point in space that i was analyzing this was right at the plane between the trailer and the tiny house so i was sort of ignoring the trailer as part of this analysis and the, my thought process was that was that the trailer is going to be there no matter what we do with the inside so i didn't really care about it but then right before I submitted this to Corbett, I was just like, well, let's go ahead and take a look and see what impact it has. And based on some of the, the preliminary weight estimates of the trailer that Corbett gave me, um, it actually has a much, much bigger impact than probably anything he's going to do with the interior finishes or the roof type or anything like that. Um, it immediately dropped that center of gravity two feet down, which is a good thing because now our tipping potential is substantially reduced because of that. Um, and we always knew the trailer was going to be there. But again, our goal here at this phase in this is really just to identify you know, what we, we can do with the inside to bring that down. And this um, is so really, this is a good point too, because there, you can make a trailer out of aluminum, which is much lighter weight, but just like John said, it wouldn't drop that center of gravity the way that the steel trailer is going to. And that actually would be a detriment to us on the road. Correct. Yep. Cool. And so kind of just big picture, uh, it's my analogy to Corbett, which may not make total sense to everybody in this call, but um, when you do energy modeling for, let's say, a home, um, your overall goal is really is not to build a model that's going to exactly predict how the house is going to perform. It's just to be able to compare alternatives to figure out what's going to be the best path forward in completion of the home. And then once the home is actually built, you refine your model to match what's actually happening. So I kind of look at this process in the same way. We're not really trying to figure out the exact, you know, square inch where the center of gravity is going to be located. We're really just trying to identify what's going to have a big, big impact and what's not, and then basically follow the path of, uh, you know, the, basically 
use the the information to identify what's going to make a big difference and what's not. So that's kind of the stage that we're at right now. Yeah. So we came up with some some ideas to try and lower the weight. Spruce plywood. Uh, my dad is a woodworker, so he's going to be helping us to build this uh, when we build it in Tampa. Um, and we're going to have to get formaldehyde-free plywood specifically. And that is something that you have to really go out of your way to find because this is a tiny space and we're going to be breathing in there. Um, so we want no formaldehyde at all, obviously. Um, the water storage, we want to have sailboat style collapsible so that we can empty it before we drive. Uh, that'll get rid of about uh, roughly 500 pounds for a, a 50 gallon uh, storage. The solar panels and the bicycles will go inside the trailer and we can put those wherever is convenient for the weight. So we can put them up near the bathroom, we can put them back near the loft, um, and either way that's going to you know, move a, a couple, you know, 100 pounds, 200 pounds maybe, just so that we can kind of play with it and really dial it in when we're on the road if we need to. And then the last thing is, we were looking into metal framing and I swear I called like <laughs> dozens of people and companies trying to figure out who can do this. And essentially the, the companies that do this, I think are not interested in tiny homes because they're so small and there's just not much profit margin. So here are our questions for you and we're gonna start taking questions from you as well. Uh, number one, are there weight saving ideas that we have not thought of that you might have uh, had occur to you? Is there lightweight furniture material that we could use aside from the spruce plywood? And then are there any concerns with the shape that we've chosen aside from the fact that it doesn't look like a normal house? And we read in a, a tiny house built book that you want it to have dormers because it, it looks like a house. Um, we don't really care. And then the last one is that I wanted to know from the people who have actually built a house, which we have not. Um, we are in houses all the time and testing them, but we've never actually done one. Are there any concerns with the framing plan? So I'd like to go ahead and open it up for some questions um, from you and have you respond to some of our questions if you have any. So Tom has a question. Will you read that? Yeah. Um, looks like you will get considerable downforce at speed. Will that create a lot of drag? John? Yes, I, mean, I don't think there's any way around drag. Um, so you're going to look at it from two ways, and, and you're absolutely correct. You're going to definitely get drag with that shape that we have. However, it is certainly much, much more aerodynamic than the other shape. The key thing with the shape here, and Corbett alluded to this very early on, is that, that uh, we're going to have to have some sort of cross bracing on this. Um, so that downward force is going to be wanted to pull this thing out and sort of turn it into a parallelogram. Uh, so that's how we're going to basically deal with the force, that downward force is through that cross bracing. Um, in terms of drag, you know, I don't even, I won't even pretend that I know how to analyze drag coefficients from one shape to another at this point. Uh, however, we, you know, it, it's certainly going to create that, that downward push, but it's much better than having that upward lift and then plus that big flat wall you'd be hitting if you were to flip around the, the shape around. Awesome. Um, so, Essentially, we want you to tune in next week. We've gone a little bit over time, and thank you guys so much for sticking it in there with us. But next week is insulation, the air sealing, and the weather barriers for this uh, tiny lab. And then on week three, we're going to talk about engineering the HVAC, which is the heating, the cooling, and the ventilation uh, of the tiny house, which in a, such a small space is super important. And you will be shocked to know what we found out, um, especially when you look at the world of tiny houses out there in the videos. And then week four, the last week is the bells and whistles where we're going to talk about the solar system and the plumbing and all that different stuff. So you can sign up um, for all the, actually, if you are signed up for this one, you're already signed up for those. And if you're watching this video after this was recorded, you can sign up for the other uh, uh, weeks of this webinar series at that website right there, Building Performance Workshop. So we'll go ahead and uh, I think that there's another question that we've got coming up here. Uh, Tom says, check into cardboard core laminates for furniture building. Very interesting. Tom, have you actually used cardboard core laminates in furniture building that you have done? Tom, I'm going to unmute you if you're okay with that. Uh, Tom is super entertaining, and he's uh, you're in Maine, right, Tom? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. I, I'm just thinking along the lines of um, uh, the boat building industry uses a lot of foam core. I know you don't want to see foam core in, in that small place there, but I think there is some things uh, doing laminates. You could probably do some wood laminate over cardboard to make some uh, uh, some cardboard, you know, that is um, sort of a honeycomb cardboard. Huh. Is and I I'm think... Didn't, I know uh, they use it in uh, making uh, wings and stuff for like uh, F-18s and things. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is awesome. All right, it's in. That's that is a done deal, Tom. Thank you very much. Is so is that durable? Like it'll last a while, right? You would hope. <laughs> cool thank you so much tom thank you so much for uh chiming in here so rachel has a question uh oh rachel says and they make great great scratching posts uh, rachel you must be a cat lady too thanks uh, yeah we're definitely not gonna let our cats uh we're very disciplined with them and we're gonna do the same with our children someday so um awesome thank you guys so much for tuning in i don't see any more questions so i hope that you'll join us in future weeks and but also i corbett is, is sometimes a little humble and goes through this but I would really appreciate it if you guys um, shared this with other tiny geeks out there. <laughs> because as you just saw, we're really curious to see what the collective conscious has to say about some of these things, which is why we've got these questions. Um, Tom just asked if we're coming to Maine, by the way. And yeah, we could absolutely come to Maine if that ends up being one of the cities that is coordinated. Um, and the campaign that we're going to be doing, which will launch in November. And so we'll talk about that later. Um, but essentially, we don't know where we're going yet. Our fans are going to pick where we go. Yeah, we're going to crowdsource it and and go where the audience tells us to. So it's going to be pretty exciting and fun. Yeah. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, John Bergman, for uh, being a special guest tonight. And he's, he's <laughs> so, such a gentleman. <laughs> Did you say something? John, I just said thank you for having me. I want to say hi to Tom too, if I'm correct. Is that Tom Smith? That That's Tom Monday? Smith, baby. Yes, Tom, I remember you. Uh, it's good to, <laughs> good to hear your voice again. Awesome. So Rachel says, "Are we going to the Solar Decathlon?" No, we're going to build this starting on November first. So we might hit that next uh, next year. And Leslie is asking about Sacramento. We are a big fan of Sacramento, and your energy. Um, the California Energy Commission, yeah, are which, big fans of us. So, so yes. <laughs> Sacramento will be very interesting for us. So, Leslie, please stay tuned and um, get in touch if you want to uh, put us in touch with a company that could possibly sponsor your city. Essentially, we'll get into how that all works in future webinars. But uh, for now, thank you guys so much. Please tune in next time, and we'll see you there.